Welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Great to have you here. Let's start up the show. Scroll down a little bit, give myself some wiggle room. What is up, folks? You're listening to The Emulsion, specifically The Emulsion episode 25. Ah, that's a good number. I'm your host, Justin Kana. This is a show where I talk all about restaurant slash chef slash fine dining news that I'm paying attention to as I continue my journey as a, as a chef, a professional chef. Today's beverage is a beverage we've never had on the show before, and that's a... Yep, I'm doing it. And it's open. Perfect. On the floor. It is a Mexican Coke. My girlfriend celebrated her 25th birthday party this past weekend. We had a big party. I made some fried chicken. It was bomb. But we also have some leftover beverages, and I've already had two cups of coffee today, so we're going to keep it a little, only only a little bit semi-caffeinated for today. And aside from that, uh, didn't we have like a cherry, mint, lime, something? I don't think that was carbonated. This is the first carbonated beverage on the Emulsion Podcast, unless... When you went on a binge and know of something more recent. Okay, anyways, I need to do a little bit of housekeeping here on the show before we get into it. And there's some social media logistics I need to address (laughs) with all of you. And I'm going to start and end the next few shows in this way, just so we can kind of get all, all on the same page. And this is a great lesson in communication for all of you that are on the kind of the up and up in the restaurant industry. I had my first experience this week with getting a ton, or at least it felt like a ton to me, of questions from you guys all across my social channels, literally all of them. I think I got requests on Instagram, I got one on Twitter, uh, one on Facebook, like a personal message on Facebook, and also in the YouTube comments. So I'm going to kind of cite a great quote that inspires me a lot and gives, uh, and then I'm going to give you my plan. And the quote goes something along the lines of, losers have goals, winners have systems. And that's by Scott Adams, the director of, uh, or the creator of the Dilbert cartoon. And no, I'm not saying you folks are losers, but my goal here with the show is to kind of have as much audience participation as possible and to take it from a goal into a system, I'm putting this system in place. So if you have a story or a question that you want covered on the Emulsion podcast, specifically on this podcast, tweet at me. You don't have to be following me on Twitter if, you know, one of you is super protective of your Twitter followers. I won't judge. Uh, Go ahead and tweet at me. So I'm at Justin underscore Kana on Twitter. I've left a link in the show notes. And go ahead and hashtag the emulsion. If you're having trouble with the 140 character limit, uh, please, I'd prefer you tag the emulsion over tagging me. And here's why. This show pretty much owns that hashtag, which to me is a representation of a good hashtag, right? Because that allows me to be able to search that hashtag and go through and just find stories from you folks. So long story short, if I don't find it on Twitter, it won't end up in the show. Unfortunately, that's just the way that it's going to have to be. Don't send me a message on Facebook. Don't comment on an Instagram photo. Don't comment on YouTube. Tweet at me. You heard it here first. I'm putting my foot down. And that helps me out a lot. I'm just a one-man band here. I don't have any managers or automation services or anything for my social media. Every like or heart or comment you guys get is from me. So if you send me something on another platform asking to be on the show, I will just politely redirect you to Twitter and ask you to kind of hashtag the emulsion. That will help me out a lot. Whew, okay. That was great. Thanks for, thanks for listening. So second, I've had a lot of you follow me on Instagram lately and comment on Uh, or, you know, comment on YouTube that you're enjoying the show, which I really, really appreciate more than any of you know. So if there's a specific question that also pertains to just you specifically, so like a question that you have uh, about your career or some issues that you're having uh, personally or some buying decisions you're debating, um, totally hit me up in the YouTube comments or slide into my DMs on Instagram. That's what that is for. So just that is me just clarifying that if you want something to be covered in the show, tweet at me with hashtag the emulsion. If you have a question that you just, you know, only pertains to you and you only want me to answer privately, go ahead and slide into those comments or into those DMs. Hope that clarifies everything. If you have any questions for me, ask me. <laughs> you know you know where to find me on the internet. So uh, also, I unfortunately uh, admittedly fell off the anchor train last week. I, you know, did a little bit of an anchor segment 
uh, teasing that I was going to do it, but last week's episode was so short that I felt like I wasn't able to deliver 100% of the quality of a show on Anchor that I would have wanted. So I, you know, I took a hit on that uh, episode 24, so we will be 100% back this week. Uh, I'm kind of counting episode 24 as a lost episode on Anchor, much like how, you know, episode 4, or was it 5, was Anchor only. (laughs) I guess that kind of pays it back, so we're, we're even now. Okay, so that addresses all of my social media qualms, all of my issues that I've been having. Uh, I hope that answers any questions that any of you might have and makes it easier for you guys to get in touch with me or be on the show. A little Mexican Coke sip there. So, without further ado, let's start it up, shall we? Uh, The first story today is all about vegetables, unique vegetables even, and the ones that an American chef, Dan Barber, has gone so far as to have created in his pursuit of great taste. So this is where, this is gonna be one of those articles, one of those stories where I possibly alienate some of you. Uh, And that's okay, Uh, but I wanna get into that conversation in the comments with all of you, so I'd love to know your thoughts on this story. So the story goes at Stone Barn Center, which is in upstate New York. He has breeders where they can basically have free reign to create, uh, and I'm quoting the article now, because quote, public plant breeders build the initial wealth of this country. True sustainability in farm to table means great flavored fruits and vegetables, and they need to be constantly updated, and that's what breeders were doing for thousands of years, end quote. That's from Dan Barber. So a few of those updated vegetables are, uh, and I'm going to give you a rundown, honey nut squash, which is apparently sweeter and more nutritious. Uh, than normal, you know, your normal everyday squash. And it's apparently engineered to hold up to slow roasting to develop a really creamy flavor. And um, Stone Barnes is, had, has this idea to serve it up more or less like a steak. So it's still apparently not quite there yet. It's still under revision. Another uh, vegetable that this article talks about is Lamoca potatoes. And these are interesting to me because you're essentially using the potato as a vessel and playing with the starch to sugar ratio. The idea with this potato is to kind of take all of the sugar out of this equation. So this idea started with chips, which is apparently a huge industry in, uh, you know, the northeast of the U.S. And they wanted a potato that didn't accumulate sugar, which apparently, well, definitely causes it to burn when it's fried. And that's apparently giving way to the possibility for him to realistically have enough of these potatoes to make a doughless pizza. So the crust in this pizza is made from potato, and this whole thing has been 10 years in the making. That's why I say he apparently has enough now to open a shop. This is going to be uh, Stone Barnes' first casual concept, where they make pizza with these potatoes, these custom potatoes that they made, so that there is essentially no gluten in this pizza dough, which is crazy to me. Magic Mountain, uh, sorry, Mountain Magic Potato uh, Tomatoes, which is, again, super interesting because all of us ha- are always kind of convinced that the heirloom tomato is superior. But Dan Barber comes along and just kind of gives us the big middle carrot here and says that this new tomato eliminates a lot of the problems that heirlooms face, like cracking and disease. And this is something that I've definitely noticed uh, going to the farmer's markets here in Seattle local, uh, lately is that a lot of these heirloom tomatoes have those uh, kind of cracks and imperfections in them, which, don't get me wrong, is definitely a sign of beauty in itself. But to these are available now, these Mountain Magic tomatoes, these ones that are don't have any of these imperfections but still have all the same taste. Uh, you can get them now. You can buy the seeds yourself, so definitely keep an eye out for those at your local market. I would assume that you know if, if he's bringing something to the table like higher yield and just as good taste, farmers are going to jump right on this kind of stuff. Another vegetable that they included in the list was Barber 2 Wheat, which is a kind of crop engineered from an old Spanish varietal of wheat called Aragon 03, where, again, the goals are higher yield, but they were able to kind of maintain all of the nutritional values and the hardiness of wheat with this crop. So what they're doing now is using this wheat for the bread service at Stone Barns right now, and it, it's definitely next level. If, if it's anything like the bread that I had with them, I want to say five years ago, it was when I graduated culinary school, it is seriously tasty. The, the coolest thing about that bread service is that they actually serve it with butter from two different cows, and it's crazy to, to, to taste the difference between two cows that, you know, have 
one, been eating things that are sometimes different, or two, they're just different animals, and you get completely different flavors out of two different butters. It's, it's seriously crazy. New England eight-row flint corn is another crop that they talk about. This is 100% a new plant, uh, but the reason that I wanted to talk about it is because it's a pretty cool story. They, it used to be huge with Native Americans on the East Coast, but then it all died in 1816. Somehow, uh, one of the crops actually made it to Italy, so it wasn't completely extinct, right? The, the varietal was still alive and well, so they took seeds from that corn and planted it at stone barns, and they've been working to preserve it ever since. So that is a, a corn that is super um, along these same lines. Higher yield, less resistant to disease, or more resistant to disease, uh, but still has all the flavor that you want in, or, you know, all the properties. They talk a lot about in the article about making polenta with this corn and how this corn has all the properties that make a very, very perfect, uh, authentic polenta. So those are five vegetables that wouldn't be here without Dan Barber and his team at Stone Barns. And I want to touch on something here that was more or less my takeaway from this story. And that's because I had a weird kind of epiphany when I was researching this story. So here, listen to this quote. Quote, to develop better tasting crops through seed saving and cross pollination, the breeders are mixing these ingredients, so to speak, but it's on the genetic level, end quote. So in this context, when I read that quote, it's all about forward thinking and innovative farming and agricultural practices, but I have no doubt there's another article just maybe one click away on the internet bashing something called a genetically modified organism, right? So GMOs are something that have gotten a hugely bad rap, especially here in the U.S. over the last few years, but if, if nothing else, I want this to serve as a lesson in education to all of you folks. I want you to be able to use this story as kind of a counter-argument to someone who sees you cooking with an eggplant that isn't, you know, an heirloom varietal, and make sure you get the full story, right? I don't want a bunch of headline readers here on the show. So here's my opinion. You can't have Earth's population increase like it has at the speed that it has and have technology help transportation as much as it has and not expect people to want better tasting, higher yielding, less prone to disease crops, right? So very similar to those people who preach something like the paleo diet and no offense to anyone who eats paleo. For those of you who don't know, the idea with the paleo diet is we never used to eat Captain Crunch and Lean Cuisine back when we were cavemen. So the diet includes nothing but what you could get hunting or gathering. And the diet blames big agriculture for a lot of the reason that a lot of us are overweight. But to me, it's a lack of big picture thinking. I'd argue that a lot of what society has achieved over the last centuries has been a direct result of not having to do things like hunt and gather and nomad around. It encourages productivity because we don't have any reason to stop or kind of put ourselves at risk. I mean, let's just talk about the amount of mental bandwidth that we have now because we don't have to go out and take down a moose or harvest berries. So the GMO argument is similar, right? The headlines say, like, they're bad, they're making us unhealthy, causing disease, and that may or may not be wrong, right? I've read articles that say the reason that some people can't eat gluten these days is because we're having have too heavily processed flour. I get, I get that. There's cases where it's absolutely true. But I'm also a huge silver lining, optimistic kind of guy, so using technology and collaboration and creative problem solving to move the needle, I'm, I'm all about that. So that's my, that's my takeaway from this story. So bravo, Dan Barber. Next up, we covered food and wines list. So we got to kind of do Bon Appetit's list as well. And that is their list of best new restaurants. So they're in the nominations phase right now, which if nothing else is a list of some of the trendiest places in the U.S. right now. So if you're heading to basically any big city in the U.S., that is a great list to consult on where you should be eating. We will no doubt cover that again once that list drops in full swing, but shout out to Marmite in Seattle for getting that representation nomination. Going to answer a quick question from you guys here, JB underscore cookery on Instagram asks, Japanese versus Western knives and why people choose one over the other? Great question. So I could go forever on this topic. It's one of those that if you guys are interested in having me make into a full-fledged YouTube video. I'm super happy to do that. Let me know in the comments and I'll be there. Um, but right now I'm interested in kind of bringing you as much value as I can in this show. So here's kind of a short version. I prefer Western style knives, but there's an asterisk on that statement, right? I prefer Japanese manufactured or inspired Western style knives. And let me give you an example. The statement that 
there's a statement that I read a long time ago when I was first starting to get into knives, and it goes something along the lines of old school Western style knives are like the Sabatiers and the Wustovs and the Henkels of the world are like big Ford trucks, right? They're beefy, dependable, workhorse style knives. And a Japanese knife is like a finely tuned sports car. It's thin, hard, customized, made from the best materials available. And to me, the best part about living in 2017 is that you get these knife makers here in the US and the UK and even in Asia who are combining the best of both of those worlds. And that's where I kind of like to live and you know buy my knives in that, in that edge of the spectrum. So this is one of those to each their own kinds of questions. I always like to ask what you're cooking, how you like to work, what your budget is, and how you care for your knives. That that to me weighs heavily into your buying decision more so than should I buy a Western style knife or a Japanese style knife. I personally sharpen all my own knives, and so I have the skill set to take care of really nice steel, but I don't want the burden of having to kind of baby a really expensive Yanagi knife. So for me, uh, Ninox, Suisun, and Misono are three of my favorite brands right now. I'd highly recommend any of theirs to anyone that's looking to get something in you know the area of the spectrum that I like to play in. Um, there's a company called Aura and another company called Bloodroot. Uh, Aura out of California and Bloodroot out of somewhere in the south, I want to say Tennessee. They're doing really, really cool stuff with great materials. I'd love to get my hands on one of those. I've actually messaged them asking to collaborate on a custom slicer for me because I want a new knife um, made by them. I want something different, and I haven't heard back from them, unfortunately. But like I said, if this is something that you folks want to hear more about, let me know in the comments, and I'll go deeper in a separate YouTube video. Uh, I have a YouTube video out about, about knives already, um, but it seems like you guys want a little bit more information. So uh, I hope I answered some questions for you or maybe turned you on to some companies that you can check out for your next purchase. If you want to see the specific knives that I use, go ahead and check me out on kit.com. There's a link for that in the show notes. Next up is a is huge news out of New York City. A friend of mine and indirect mentor of mine, Corey Chow, was just named Chef de Cuisine of Per Se. So huge applause there. And I say indirect mentor because he was my sous chef when I was an extern at Per Se in 2013. And he actually came to visit Lisvaka in Norway. Uh, I had the pleasure to cook for him and his family there. Um, so he's been in my life... It, in and out. I, I don't talk to him on the daily. We don't have any sort of connection these days. Um, he's off obviously doing bigger and better things. Uh, but he is taking Eli Kaime's place as chef de cuisine at Per Se. And then, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, there's a ton of pressure on him from the press at this very moment in time, right? Because all these headlines are going around. I mean, we're even talking about it here. Um, but for those of you who have been following per se lately know that there hasn't been a ton of great media talking going on about per se going down in the world's 50 best list the two-star new york times review a not so great eater write-up a lot of the press now is asking can chef chow bring new life into thomas keller's new york spot for me time will tell i think i know for me when i think the word finesse i think of Corey chow so there's no doubt all of the staff there has an insanely talented leader in their midst so i'm nothing but excited to see him in that much deserved position plus it's his birthday today so i had to give a shout out on the show happy birthday chef next up is a story another story from you guys budge's fine workshop on youtube asks what are my views on the new hexagon restaurant opening in canada and to be honest, uh, Budge's Fine Workshop, you turned me on to this place. I did some research, and here are my thoughts. So the chef is decorated for sure. Sean McDonald has San Pellegrino's Young Chef in 2016, I believe. He has that on lockdown. He definitely has some networking skills. He does some pretty cool collaborations with other chefs as the restaurant is kind of opening, which I think is super smart. The space is really nice. Uh, beautiful marble, wood, blue leather, natural wood. Um... The food, though, it looks to me a little bit like all of the other one- and two-star Michelin restaurants here in the U.S., right? It's nothing you have, haven't have seen before on kind of like the appetizer or main course side of things. It's beautiful, don't get me wrong, but it's almost it almost reminds me of um, Brian Voltaggio's food. If you've never seen his uh, food before, it, it's very, very similar to that in a weird way. So I'm going to read you a few dishes off of a sample menu. 
raw scallop, cucumber, beef garum, herbs. Another dish is onion, maple, smoked carrot. Another dish is sablefish, mole blanco, crema, lobster butter. Another dish is strawberry, rhubarb, almond, spruce. So they're very vague, uh, like a lot of these other restaurants with their menu descriptions. And yes, I know this menu is from a collaboration dinner, but they're scheduled to open this month, so I'm excited to see more of their own signature food. Um, what I thought was funny is that I got the request to cover this story, and one of their dishes popped up in my news feed like as I was scrolling just randomly through Instagram. They did a dessert that is a play on a pinata, where they dangle a red, possibly chocolate thing on a string above the dish, and then smash it over the plate with a table, with a knife table side, and a bunch of little balls spill out. So that's super fun, that's interesting, that's definitely an Instagram dish, well done, well done with that. Is, are they do, is Hexagon doing something that's never been done before? No. Is his food beautiful? Yes. I'd be interested to have a meal. I'm feeling a little bit shallow about my answer here, and I'm really kind of grasping at straws to give you some value on this story. You should know that about me, though, all of you listening, that I won't say anything good or bad about a restaurant until I've eaten there. And then, on the flip side, and I will always, almost always mention when I ate there on the show, because in my opinion, whatever I say about that restaurant has about a six-month shelf life on it, because... I, I just know restaurants change, right? So menus change, staff changes. So, And with that, the experience of eating at that restaurant changes as well. So I wish I could tell you more about this restaurant, but to be honest, there isn't enough content out about that restaurant for me to say. I don't even know what's in this pinata dish, right? Oh, uh, cancel, cancel. I, I, I did my research on this show, and this isn't even close to what I was expecting, but the pinata dish is black bean ice cream, sweet pork skin, fried bean crumb, crumb, Fermented guava curd, aged queso cream, guava patifui, chocolate pi- white chocolate piñata. So I was definitely right on the chocolate part for sure. So regardless, you should check out their website. There's a dope uh, hexagon animation that happens when you visit their website. It's uh, hexagonrestaurant.com. I've left links to all of this in the description, including the piñata uh, dish. But I'd be curious to know, uh, what do you guys get excited about with new restaurants? I'd love to know in the comments or hit me up on Twitter. I really like when you guys tell me about new spots, ones that you're excited about. Uh, I mean, they're constantly opening and closing, and the world is a really big place, so it helps when you folks are so uh, global uh, all over the place and you ask questions about places you're excited about, and then that kind of forces me to research them. So Hexagon is on my radar now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Next up is a really great article from a dear friend of mine. Uh, He shared it in his own network, and I saw it, and I read it, and I I just had to share it. So that is coming from Chicago Magazine. It's all about the legacy of Charlie Trotter. And this is one of those pieces that's an article that I just end up quoting a lot. So if you like long form and you like learning a little bit about the history of why we're at where we're at in fine dining, I highly, highly recommend it. It talks all about... Things like smashing the Eurocentric mold, working with the seasons and local farms, how Charlie Trotter kind of was a pioneer in that in that realm. Dining as theater, uh, we know all of the, I mean, we just talked about a pinata dish at, at the table. And even being a tyrant in the kitchen, that is a really, really interesting piece that the article closes on. Um, all things that Trotter was kind of doing in the 90s that... Um, they ask Chef John Shields, who is the chef of Smith and the Loyalist in Chicago. Uh, he quotes in the article as saying, I can see now why he did it. And that was mostly in reference to the being a tyrant in the kitchen thing, because he experiences very similar things in his kitchen. Um, but it's a really, really interesting look back onto the things that you know we see of as trends or staples now, uh, but this is a guy who was in the Midwest of the U.S. doing these things just out of pure creativity and inspiration. I really, really enjoyed that. So for me, there's extreme inspiration in me reading this story because there's something about having a vision for something, something like, and sticking to it, having so much focus and keeping it so close to you that people think you're crazy and then picking the hard road over the easy way out that just really gets me all jazzed up. I, I of course, never had the chance to cook or work or eat at Charlie Trotter's, but there's no denying his influence on especially American fine dining, more specifically in Chicago. 
it's one of those things that for me too that maybe makes Chicago one of those cities I was never really happy cooking in. Uh, only now that I'm talking about it and kind of seeing someone trace it all the way back to that one person, do I realize that his motivation was there, the way that he went about it didn't necessarily lead to a great kitchen culture, especially uh, just for me, for my own, for my own, the way that I like to work and the way that I kind of like a kitchen environment to be. So I lasted it for eight months in Chicago at Grace. I, you know, I, I didn't have a great time staging at Alinea. And it just wasn't for me. I, I, I did so much better in California and New York and Europe. And maybe that's a lesson here. Culture is important. And that no doubt comes from the top, good or bad. So it, it, is the vision more important than the people? When do you kind of prioritize cooking knowledge over emotional intelligence? And to me, it's a people game, 100%. But I'd love to know what you guys think and how many of you like learning about this kind of fine dining history stuff because I'm all about it. I think it's really, really interesting. This show is something coming together so nicely and that, you know, I, I script out these shows so that keeps the conversation rolling, but I wanted to acknowledge the flow of today's show. It is so, it's so funny because this last show is from one of you guys, James Cole Brown from Australia asked me my thoughts on this article here. And it's all about Mitch Orr, who is a chef in Sydney who has a podcast of his own called The Mitchin. First of all, great name. Second of all, how do we get you on this emulsion podcast, Mitch? I would love to chat. And what he's talking about is all about how restaurants are changing and how that you know tyrant mentality isn't tolerated anymore and how the importance of community is vital to restaurants and especially cities. So he argues that, quote, sharing and looking out for one another pushes the industry forward, end quote. So to answer one question James had, the gentleman who proposed this story to me, and yes, the culture, he, he asked, I don't know how similar American cooking culture is. To answer your question, yes, the culture is changing a little bit here in the U.S., but that, the, to me, this directly relates to the story all about Charlie Trotter because to me, it starts at the top, right? If you're, if you're a restaurant in a big city and you're a chef that's shooting for the stars and the accolades and those kitchens can tend to get pretty cutthroat because they do require long hours and relying on people that might let you down and you know people with reputations on the line and skill becomes involved then and so much more and when you mix all of those variables in a bowl it's not unusual to see the worst sides of human nature come to the surface so his defense to this Mitch Orr is to keep things transparent right to get to know other restaurants and chefs and sommeliers and servers and dishwashers and farmers everyone that's involved so that you can share ideas and passion and respect and create that restaurant bond and network basically at scale with an entire city or country instead of just keeping it in your own space. I'd argue that social media helps with this more than ever and that's one of the reasons why it's possible to have that kind of restaurant environment right now in a very 2017 way. I keep in touch with so many people at scale because of social media and I share a lot about what I'm up to and it might seem weird right now, but I know I know this plays out for me. I know I'm gonna win and I know it's the right thing to do because I don't get any pleasure in backstabbing or gossiping or sharing, inf like quote, like the article says, quote, sharing information, recipes, techniques, ingredients. Uh, sorry, I don't get any pleasure in not doing any of that kind of keeping it and hoarding it to myself. I love sharing my, 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 all of it. That's why this show exists. So to me, you have to kind of ride a certain line. And the restaurant that I was at in Norway taught me a lot about this, keeping those high standards, keeping your, um, keeping your high standards and keeping the discipline, right? Keeping the vision of the chef close at hand, but also having each other's back. And that was something that was super close to how we ran the restaurant, how everything operated. And the only reason why not everybody does it is this. It's hard. <laughs> it takes work. And there's only, there's, to me, there's only positives that come from it. But you have to be willing to put in that work. And you have to be, in my opinion, talented enough to pull it off. I'd said, I, I've said it way too many times on this show now, but here we go one more time. This, this kind of stuff comes from the top, and whether it's the head chef or the general manager or the owners, if they're good enough, it's an incredible place to work. And that's why I bring up Chef Christopher Hatuft from Norway, because I respect him so much. 
Oh, what a great way to end the industry stories. We're going to have another uh, quick Anchor exclusive story, so make sure you head over to that platform to check that out. Um, I'm, again, by my Twitter handle. If you are having trouble accessing that, go to my Twitter, Justin underscore Kana. That's my user, username there, and you can go ahead and check me out on Anchor. I'd love to have you call in there with some of your thoughts. Uh, but for right now, let's transition real quick into this week's non-industry story, and that's all about this YouTube channel called Captain Disillusion, all about trick shots, his definitive guide. And it's, it's, you just have to see it. It's, it's weird. It, it's very well done. He is a visual effects artist himself, so he kind of puts that own spin on it. But if you've seen at least one trick shot video on YouTube in your life, you'll lols at this one, much like I did. I almost forgot. I, I almost forgot this one. I, I dropped something for you folks on Medium, and it's free. It's a bunch of my macro food photography that I do sometimes. If you follow me on Instagram, you know all about that. I will. Um, I have this macro lens, and I'll kind of like put it right up next to a piece of corn or an asparagus and get really, really interesting perspectives on ingredients that hopefully you and I work with on the day-to-day. But I made them into wallpapers for your phone, and they're available to download for free. I have the crab one as my background right now. Here, I'll show you video folks what it looks like. So it looks like that. So this is an up-close shot of a crab shell, and I think it's pretty cool as my iPhone background. So a bunch of those are up on the Medium article. There are even some photos that I haven't published yet on Instagram. I haven't really marketed this whole thing that well either. This is a project for tomorrow for me, but I wanted you Emulsion folks to hear it first because I only get to talk to you guys once a week. So last night I basically needed a break from typing out the show, so I just took a few minutes and made some photos into wallpapers for you. But like I said, there's a link in the show notes uh, for that for you if you need a little bit of beauty in your life that's also food related. Um, if you're not somewhere that has show notes, go ahead and just search Justin Khan on Medium and it'll pop right up. Um, so if you're like me and think that food looks so cool when it's hella up close, I hope you will enjoy that segment. All right, with that, this has been episode 25 of The Emulsion. I really, really want to thank you so much for listening. I always appreciate your ears. If you have a story that you're interested in getting a shout out on the show, go ahead and tweet at me at Justin underscore Kana and hashtag The Emulsion, and I'll be sure to read all about it. Until next week, folks, my name's Justin Kana. Have a good one.